Good morning, everyone, or good good afternoon. So I'm not sure where the slides are. So I will be talking about something that is, I believe it's fascinating. It's which way we explore the frontier of our solar system. So the last, the, the most farther one that I will talk about today is comets. And uh, basically, I will talk about the Rosetta mission. So uh, for many of you who, who are not familiar about the Rosetta mission, uh, I think yes, yes. OK. So for m m many of you who are not familiar about Rosetta mission, it's a mission that is dedicated to explore comets. And comets are bodies made of ice. And why they are important? Because they are the mechanism by which we are able to transport organic material and ice and water in the solar system. So why this is important? Because it's comets who were able to bring organics from the cool areas of the solar system to the warm areas of the solar system and contribute to life. And actually, comets contributed to our existence on this place. So, so the Rosetta mission is a mission that aim to explore the nucleus of Comet 67P. So maybe I can move here so I can see the slides. And uh, so if you watch at night, Comet 67P, it's a small point that is moving in the sky. And I know that you hear this in the press every day, especially here in Egypt, about an asteroid hitting the Earth. I think it's, it's a monthly thing. Every month, we hear in the news there is an asteroid that's going to hit the Earth in December or, or in March or in the summer. And in fact, this is not true. But we witnessed it in 1994, one case where the comet Levi Shoemaker 2 have entered the atmosphere of Jupiter, dissociated in 12 Perhees. And as you see in these uh, images here, these, uh, this comet have hit Jupiter. And if Jupiter was not there, this comet could have been very close to the Earth. So understanding the impact and the, by comet is very important to understand the evolution and our, and our presence on this planet. So the Rosetta mission, for many of you who don't know what's a satellite or maybe haven't been in contact with some of these objects, the Rosetta mission is a huge satellite. It's a 2,000 kilogram satellite. So, and as you can see, it's, this is the main body of the Rosetta satellite. This is the size of a human. And if you see the lander is what you see in this, uh, this part. So Rosetta mission is two components. There is the main orbiter and there is the small uh, a small lander, the Philae lander. And amazingly, today we are here in Egypt, and we landed about a year from now. So Rosetta mission is the only mission that have all of its, in, all of the, its uh, experiment, basically, having Egyptian name and the mission itself having an, an Egyptian name. So if you see the solar panel of the Rosetta mission, they are huge. They are the size of a half of a football field. And why? Because it's going very far in the solar system, and the solar radiation is very weak. So this is, is an artist uh, rendering of Rosetta. And this is how it is approaching the comet. So landing on a comet is a very difficult thing. Why? Because the comets are low gravity body. So we, you cannot have an orbit, a gravitational orbit around it very easily. You basically need to be very careful when you land because if you land at a high speed or even very uh, high, uh, very low speed that you can bump and be ejected out of the surface. So that's basically how the landing we thought. It would, it, that's basically the, the spacecraft dissociated the lander, the Philae lander, and it takes nine hours to go from the orbit where there is the Philae lander to the surface. And it took 10 years to get the Rosetta mission from Earth to Comet 67P. 
So the main uh, the, the, the experiment I work on is called CONCERT, and its aim, uh, science objective, is to understand the nucleus of the comet, what comets are made of inside, and how they break, and how they collide with each other, and how they form, and how they evolve, and they lose their ice around the solar system. So again, as I mentioned, it took us 10 years from lunch to meet. We launched it in 2004, and we reached the comet in uh, in August 2014. So I still remember that day. I still remember when we approached the comet and then the day of the landing, and I will tell you about it. So th this is how we orbit the comet until we land. So it's a very awkward orbit. And this is the first image we get from the OSIRIX camera when we were about a few hundred kilometers away from the comet. So the comet has an uneven shape. It has the body and the head. It looks like a duck, these yellow duck. You can have in the shower, for these of you who still have yellow ducks in the shower, the comet looks like this one. So when we approached, the comet looked really not as smooth, as not as a nice place as we thought. It's full of impacts. It's the surface is very rugged. And now we have a month to decide where we're going to land on this body. So I still remember that day when we received the phone call from NASA and European Space Agency, and the, we made a team, and we looked to the images, and we looked to the engineering requirement, where we're gonna land, and we were told this. If you land, this project will continue. If you guys miss the landing, this project is shut down after 10 years of work. So you have 30 days to make a landing happening. So people, just to give you an idea, the Comet 67P, is about the size of the downtown of Los Angeles. So if I put it in Egypt, it will be the double of the size of the island of Zamalek. So it's not that big body. So on the 14th of November, the decision was made that we will start the landing. Two hours before the decision was made, we received a phone call that the landing system will not work. So the trust to to deaccelerate the landing is not working. And now we have to make a very hard decision. Land with high risk or cancel the landing. Because we then we will be very far from the comet and the comet start to be active and we cannot land. And this is, is a lesson in life. In many times in your life, you have to go beyond logic to make a success. You have to take a lot of risks. You have to put your job on the line to do something meaningful. So the team decided that we're going to do the highly, the risky landed, and this is, is the first uh, image of the dissociation of the spacecraft from the mother, uh, the fillet lander from the mother spacecraft. And these are the camera images from the mother spacecraft to the lander, and the lander started the descent. So it took us for eight hours. We have no signal. So you can imagine what is staying for eight hours w waiting for your lander to give you a signal that it landed. So then we started the navigation camera on the lander, started to show us our landing location, which are this location, and you can see there are many big rocks here. So we're not landing on the smooth place we thought we we're gonna be landing. And then we start to approach more, and while we are approaching, we start to see features that we never thought they exist on planet, like these t t t towers of ice, that if you put the Eiffel Tower by it, it will be 300 meters. And then we started to see, this is, is the camera is showing the impact location. So this is, is where we have a first impact. And I remember at that moment, all the news agency, they started to show the pictures of people, they hugging each other. I think many of you here have seen this picture people in the room, control room, and, and they're lifting their hands that we landed. But a small group of us, which worked on the radar instrument, we were not lifting our hand. In fact, we were looking to the signal bringing from the spacecraft, from the radar, and I explained it very, very, very simply. This is the t time in, in second, and this is the power of the signal we received from the communication antenna. And the signal was waving was waving, you see these waves? So if the spacecraft landed, 
the signal should not be waving. So if you are the receiver and I am the antenna, and I'm, I am in a static position, there is no reason why the signal will wave this way. And in fact, the signal was waving because the spacecraft wasn't static. It was rotating like this around itself and moving from position to position. And the dance started. Rosetta started to dance, and then we realized that we, are not, we did not landing. We are jumping a few hundreds of meters on the surface of the comet. And this is, is our first jump. This is, is our second jump. The spacecraft is here. And this is, is our third jump. We are here. So the spacecraft is jumping on the surface of the comet. And these are the images of the different timing and the different position the spacecraft jumped. And finally, the spacecraft stopped somewhere in a ditch. And we started the search for the Philae lander. Where is the Philae lander? And it was only in July uh, this year, a uh, few, uh, 10 months after the landing, that we were able to locate the spacecraft and wake up the spacecraft again in the largest, most ambitious rescue operation ever happened in the life of a space mission. You are waking up a spacecraft millions of kilometers away with very limited resources in terms of energy and power. And we started the operation of our instrument. We started to see deep inside of the comet nucleus and we used these radar waves to locate the area of the landing. And this is our images from the paper, which we published in August in Science magazine. And we were able to locate the strip where is the spacecraft and to point the communication antenna to that area and wake up the spacecraft. Uh, these are the type of the signals we get. I don't want to go through a lot of details on it, but basically, we use to classify the signal in terms of the strength and to see which one goes deep inside the comet, which one does not go. And this is how the concert experiment work. You send a radio wave, and these radio waves go through the inner structure of the comet. These are uh, the cross section of the comet. And we use that reflected signal you see here to understand what this comet is made of. Is it one body? Is it uh, two body? So, and is it is, is two body that collided at low temperature, or is two body uh, who, who it's one body that has been shaped in this way? So, another the experiment we had is the Dawn experiment, which basically used similar technology. I don't want to go through a lot of technical details. Uh, and it basically we use the reflection of the radar signal between the spacecraft and the, the uh, uh, asteroid Vesta and the receiving station on the Earth to understand the, the roughness of the surface of dawn and to understand the shock history on the size of this body. So I just want to tell you that the difference in working on mission like asteroids and comet is very different from a regular mission to Mars or going to the moon. It's full of risk. It's full of surprises. So you go to your office every day, and it's only your ability to survive uh, the unpredictable that can make you do something meaningful. So I have to commend that these are the team that sh contributed to the landing, and it was an honor to be a part of that uh, team, as long uh, as well also as three fellow Egyptians also who worked on uh, th that team, and I want to acknowledge them, uh, Ahmed Al Shafi, Asam Maruf, and Rami Al Maari. Uh, two young people and, w and one senior Egyptian have contributed to that. If I was lucky in something in my life, it would be that I had never uh, take the time to be depressed or desperate. I was one day teaching in, uh, teaching in the Cairo University in the astronomy department, and I work in NASA to teach the astronaut now how they can go on these missions and how they collect the samples on Mars and future missions on the moon. And was able to build and contribute to the build of the spacecraft that will tomorrow go, uh, will help the astronauts go on the moon and on Mars. And did even some of these exercises when you have to design the habitat of these astronauts on the moon, 
So these are, you see here, are the habitat of the astronauts that will return on the moon on 2035, and these are the rovers that help them make some reconnaissance. So uh, my message to the youth who are here is that in many time, you have to, to keep dreaming because you cannot afford to live in the reality nightmare. I hate realistic people, and I think they have no place in history because they don't change anything. It is these who dreamed about walking to the moon that make history. These who thought that we cannot do it have never made history. No one actually talk about them today, but they were the majority when all of this has started. When we started Rosetta, people say it's impossible. When we started Mars program, people say it's crazy, but it is these ambitious stuff, these technological endeavors that make human history. And I would love that all of you cont contribute to the future in that. So these are pictures of the astronaut we train actually, and they are collecting the ice sample. Uh, for those of you who are interested in fashion, I want to tell you that the astronaut costume is the most expensive thing you can wear. It's $18 million just to wear this. This thing, ugly thing, it's most cost more than the Princess Diana wear. So I was grateful to have many students, many smart people that I work with, and I think these have made everything possible. It's only young people who made this possible. Uh, many of them are Egyptian, the three of them I mentioned. In some time, I wished that many of the media that talked about exploration on Mars from all the press would reach Egypt and will empower Egyptian youth. And fortunately, for those of you who read in Arabic, this is, is the image of science. So the scientists are the traitors and the spies. Uh, we train astronauts to go to the moon that I have never heard of. We cure HIV with antennas. We connect rivers between each other. So there are super bad people in media, but there are also some good ones that are there. And I will stand with us. Thank you. So we have three minutes for questions. Any questions? Any insults? Any? So where is the mic for the questions? I see some hand rising, but I don't see where they get the mic. Okay, so let me ask you a question. How many of you dreamed one day to be an astronaut or to be on space mission? So many people. Very good. So this is always what I say, that the scientists are inspiring. Many of the decision makers do not realize that. There are so many people who want to be in science, very few people who maybe want to be in other stuff. So if science can empower every one of you. That would be super amazing. And today, I think, here in Egypt, we need that. We need that because our problems will not change, will not be resolved without uh, technology involvement, without empowering the people, without each one of you going to university to study and try to make something useful for this community. So. My message to the students here, my message to people who work on technology, it's a tough business we are living in because we may be speaking a language that may not go in the media as this stuff, so people maybe will not listen. But with the contribution of every one of you trying to make a speech and repeating that speech every day, that we need the science, that we need the education, maybe this is, can change one day. It will change one day, it's not maybe but you have to keep insisting and never be desperate. And uh, I think I talked too much, so I'll stop here. Thank you.